Go ahead. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of our Mellowstone seminar series. Uh, today, I'm happy to present um, Peter Quakenbush, who is going to be talking about his work on Metanilla, part one. Hopefully, there will be two or three or four more parts coming in the future. Certainly, this very large assemblage, very complicated group of species and probably associated genera, there's lots to talk about here in terms of their evolutionary relationships, biogeography, ecology, and other things, which Peter is going to start to tell you about right now. All right. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to be able to talk about Metanilla. So yeah, the, the title, it's a little bit short, it's a little bit boring, but I really do hope that it leaves you anticipating more. So part one, like Darren said, this is a large group that really would do it an injustice to try to cram everything into one talk. So today I want to sort of build a foundation of interest for people. And then um, in the future, maybe next year or so, we can present some of the uh, wonderful things we've been learning about this group and results of, of various things we've been working on. So let's go. All right. So it kind of all started for me on this mountain here, Mount McKeeling, which is in the Philippines. And at the base of it is the University of the Philippines. So I wanted to study some tropical plants in a tropical place. This seemed like a really good place to, to do it. I had a previous connection to the location. So my wife and I showed up here and I started a master's in botany. And one of my first courses that I was in was a plant systematics course. And one of the uh, assignments for that was to go out and to collect some plants. So after the fact, I realized that most people had just kind of wandered around campus and take, taken uh, clippings from the shrubberies. But obviously, I went to the mountain, <laughs> which I was sort of blissfully um, ignorant of the fact that you kind of needed permits to collect there. But I was there nonetheless. And at the top, I was greeted by this beautiful sight. I remember kind of being struck by it because I just kind of popped out onto this little peak area, this peak of Mount McKeeling, and there was just shrubs everywhere and they were in full bloom. And it, so little pink flowers, kind of interesting anthers, the leaves had these parallel veins in them. I didn't have any idea what they were, but I collected them. And um, in the same location, basically, there was another small epiphyte. And this one just had little red berries at the time, but it had pretty similar leaves too. So they were, they had the, the parallel veins in them. And I collected that one too. And then uh, uh, later, I discerned that both of these were actually metanilla and that there weren't just these two species of metanilla on this mountain, there were actually nine others. So a total of 11 had been listed from this single mountain. And um, looking into them a little bit further, it turned out that very little was known about their ecology. And there was quite a lot of questions kind of re regarding their systematics um, and taxonomy. And it seemed like a really good test group or study group to focus on. So as I was going around gathering my uh, committee together, really the first question everyone was asking was, what do you want to study? And I would suggest Metanilla. And so here I am, that was 2015 and it's 2021 and I'm still working on Metanilla. Nobody has told me to stop and it's uh, been pretty good since. So what I want to do actually is zoom back out, Mount McKeeling here for reference. And I kind of want to take you on this virtual tour. So we're going to start at the bottom. I'm going to introduce you to some of the species um, that you can find along one trail, basically in one watershed. And with those, I will be able to introduce you to some of the interesting features and characteristics of kind of larger groups of Metanilla, um, many that you find in the Philippines and beyond. So we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. So the first one that you can see uh, is Metanilla venosa. And this one is special kind of in the fact that 
it's one of the very, very few Philippine metanel that is not actually endemic to the Philippines. So it can be found south of the Philippines. But originally it was described as part of being part of a different genus. And that's because uh, primarily it had fuzzy hypanthia, which you can't really see very well here, but it also had these kind of, kind of large leafy bracts. So this was put in the genus Hypananthi. And since then it has been um, synonymized with metanilla, probably for good reason, but it is fairly distinctive. So um, the leaves, basically all parts of it can be fuzzy. It's a terrestrial shrub. So it's rooted in the ground and it tends to like areas that are a little bit more like secondary growth. So in real mature forest that is very tall and shady, it tends to get shaded out and become very rare. So on this particular side of the mountain, it had been logged a long time ago and um, the forest has gotten quite tall and mature. So it's becoming quite rare on that side. And actually this clump right here that is photographed um, in the process of a road expansion project was totally bulldozed while I was there, which was pretty sad, but I was able to observe it for a while first. Um, and with that, I was able to see that medium-sized bees came and visited and did the pollinating. Um, but also in these pictures, you can see, not very well, but there's a little dot right here. That's an ant and it's feeding on a, a petal tip. So there's nectar coming out. And then if you were to go to these pictures over here in the corner, and zoom in, there would be a little tiny droplet of nectar at each of those petal tips as well. So that is an interesting feature um, that is actually a bit more widespread in Metanilla. So it was first noted in Metanilla Magnifica. Um, the, the purpose was kind of unknown, but here we have photos of Metanilla Magnifica, and then there's ants basically on all the petal tips and they're drinking little droplets of nectar. Here we have another picture of Metanilla Venosa different species of ant on it. Here at the petal tip, here's Metanilla bonahensis, here's Metanilla polylensis. And uh, I love this picture because there's a giant ant and a, and a tiny little pink dot on every, every petal tip right there. So um, really it's not associated with pollination at all. Like in, in many cases, it's being exuded from buds that are not even open yet. And then where it is open, um, the ants really don't come in contact with the pollen that is hidden inside of these anthers. So probably has to do with ant guards. But until recently, I thought it, it might be a general metanilla thing, but actually I, was, um, I learned that uh, not only is it in metanilla, which is right here, but it's also in Tashiroea and it's in Tigridio palma. So two genera that are possibly closely related to Metanilla, or at least in the same tribe of Sonorilli. Um, so I'd, I'd love to, to know if anyone has found this outside of this tribe. Um, but while I'm on this, I guess, phylogenetic slide right here, I would like to point out that traditionally Metanilla has been um, considered part of the Daisukidi. And so that's showing up way here. And basically that's because it was a paleotropical group and it had um, berry fruit. But this Daisokiti has been revised now. And this is really something that has been known for about 20 years, but Metanil belongs in the Sonorilli. And I guess we can officially say that it, it's part of the Sonorilli. So um, back to, to Metanilla venosa again, real quick. I wanna say something about the fruits. So here we have an inflorescence. There's fruits of all different stages. Some of them are ripe and some of them are not. And you really can't tell very well which ones are ripe except by size. So in this species, which is pretty different from most of the other species, there is no visual change when the fruit becomes ripe, um, which got me wondering how things could tell if it was ripe or not. So one day I smelled it and there was this beautiful uh, tutti fruity odor that my my simple nose was able to detect. And then if you do a little taste comparison uh, between all the metanilla that I've tasted, this is by far the most flavorful. It kind of tastes like green apple or uh, pear. So it doesn't visually change when it's ripe. It smells really nice. It tastes really nice. And then um, also combine that with the fact that um, very similar species, uh, 
So Metanil lagune, Metanil philippinensis, they have this very strong tendency towards cauliflurry, um, which basically makes it easier for clumsy things or things that are clumsier than birds to access the fruit. So we have cauliflurry, we have no visual change, we have a smell and we have a taste, which all combined to make this really strong case for I think bat dispersal. I haven't confirmed it, but um, it's, it's something out there that I think would be pretty interesting to test. So this is, we're still in the, the low mountain forest. We're gonna move on up the trail and we're gonna meet another species here. So this is a tall climber and it reaches, it's, it's rooted in the ground, but it climbs up the trees. It starts in the ground and um, reaches the canopy and then spreads out up there. So there's actually two tall canopy climbers in that photo. One of them, is of course me and I'm particularly happy because this species uh, had not been collected from this mountain in almost exactly 100 years. So I found it up there. And um, let me just say that I have um, extreme respect for actual tree climbers who make this sort of work look effortless because this was really one of the harder things uh, that I've done and some people just do it, no problem. <laughs> but. Um, so yeah, this is Metanilla radicans, or at least what I call Metanilla radicans. And the leaves are kind of interesting in this family in that many of them lack the kind of secondary veins. So some, oftentimes it's just the primary vein here. And so it just kind of looks like a normal angiosperm leaf. It doesn't have that characteristic melastom leaf. Um, also they are in a whirl, typically of four, uh, um, typically of five or six. The flowers are quite large and they are pretty distinctively um, dimorphic or they, they show this heteranthery here, which is also interesting because um, technically speaking, metanilla shouldn't have heteranthery, but I would actually consider this to be extremely similar to, if not the same as the type species, metanilla metanilliana, which also, it also exhibits this heteranthery. So it does exist and it is fairly widespread um, and it tends to be in these large flowers like this one. Um, and it's visited by large xylocopa um, carpenter bees. So these top ones are often called feeder anthers. They're a little bit more ornate. And then there's some more obscure ones down here that kind of have access more to the, the back of the bee or the, the end of the bee. And uh, those are called pollinating anthers. So they, they take their food pollen from up here and then unbeknownst to them, they kind of engage in pollination down there as well too. And then this poor quality photo here because I've zoomed way into the canopy is some ripe fruit. So these do change colors when they are ripe. Um, this is a different species, but it's showing something important. And basically things in this group have a very thick pericarp. So in comparison to other metanilla, sometimes which have just basically a paper thin pericarp around here, this is quite thick. So large berries, large fruit, large bees. Um, and then this involved some more tree climbing, but um, we have a monkey, we have a parrot, we have a flower pecker, we have a couple nocturnal visitors, one's a civet cat, there's a, a giant grasshopper, and this was triggered by a bat wing flying by. I don't know if the bat was eating it or not, but it was at least there. So really, this one has a, a generalist vertebrate dispersal syndrome. They're kind of easy for everything to access, and they're large, juicy uh, fruit that lots of things like to eat. Um, but ants may also play a role in dispersal. So when the fruit falls to the ground, Sometimes they're mobbed by ants and oftentimes they will get, have this hole kind of drilled into them or, or not away and then all the seeds get, get taken out of that. So maybe some local dispersing is happening there. Um, all right, so moving on. So we're moving from the lowland forest basically to the mid mountain forest. And we encounter a very similar species um, to that first one. It's rooted in the ground. It's a tall canopy climber, but this one has just leaves in worlds of three or they're opposite, they're much bigger leaves, but it has really large flowers, really large fruit. Again, it has the heteranthery, it's visited by those large um, carpenter bees. And actually, if we include a, a proposed synonym, which is Metanilla uh, megacarpa, which actually is pretty different, but um, 
I would submit this and put it in the running for being the metanilla with the largest flower and the largest fruit. So the, the petals can easily be five centimeters long and the, and the fruit are really, really big. So pretty impressive um, species right there. So now still in the mid-mountain forest, there's a, a, another climber. So far, we've only met things that are rooted in the ground. So this is rooted in the ground, but it doesn't reach the canopy. This one just lives on the trunk. Um, so here we have a the largest individual that I, that I saw, but it's a kind of a small palm tree and climbing up the trunk is this Metanilla turnifolia. And like the first one, Metanilla venosa that we saw, uh, kind of all parts of it can be hairy and it has these bracts and the hypanthium is hairy too. So originally it would have been put in that hypananthi um, genus, but this one is a climber and it has trifoliate leaves there. Um, but this one's different from venosa in that when the fruit is ripe, it does distinctly change color. So it gets this nice dark color. But also interestingly, the bracts start out this pale green when it's flowering, but then as the fruit develops, they turn this nice bright red. So also it's, it's very visually apparent when it's ripe and birds like flower peckers come by and readily snap them up. Um, I also wanna point out that Medium-sized bees tend to visit this one. All the anthers are the same, and the stigma is, is underneath the bunch of anthers, which is up at the top there. So moving on, still in the mid-mountain forest, this is obviously um, a favorite zone for many metanilla, but we have a metanilla astronoidus. Uh, the leaves look very much like the group that was talked about last month, astronia, um, can be easily confused with those. And, Actually, Regalado, kind of the previous worker on this group, placed it in the same group as um, Carionia elegans, which was uh, previously kind of one of the small genera that has been subsumed in Metanilla. So that was distinguished by having six Myris flowers, so having six petals, and then also having a very distinct crown, which you can sort of see here. Um, but interesting enough, it also has a very thick pericarp, kind of like that those climbing group, that climbing group that we saw. But anthers in a bunch, they're, they're up um, on top of the stigma right there. Um, and it actually does quite well in the understory of uh, the forest. So it's, it's happy to, to be in the shade basically. And it can form these nice big groves that when they're all fruiting is, is quite pretty. Um, still in the mid mountain forest, we meet the, the metanilla that perhaps most people are familiar with. So if you go to basically any botanical garden, you can probably find one of these there. This is metanilla magnifica, living in its um, natural habitat on a very rare sunny day. And this is a very large epiphyte. So it can be in the canopy of the tree, but it really starts in the canopy. And if it's an old individual and it's been there long enough, it can eventually send down roots that connect to the ground, but it doesn't have to be connected to the ground. Oftentimes it's not connected to the ground, it's just kind of up in the tree. Um, these ones have relatively large flowers, so they are pollinated by the large bees. Um, flower peckers will come by and snap up the, the dangling fruit there. Um, and I think that's about it for that one. Again, in still in the mid-mountain forest, here we have Metanilla myrtiformis, which I introduced you to from the peak. Um, this one is another one that was originally described in a different genus, Anplectrum, and that's basically because it has anthers that are not very typical Metanilla anthers. And as opposed to all the other ones that we've met so far, these anthers form a cone around the, the stigma and the, the style. And they also have very pointed petals. Um, so in many regards, this one's quite different. The pericarp is very thin. It's a very small plant. It's an epiphyte um, in the canopy, at least um, if it's in the mid-mountain forest, it's, it's always in the canopy with exposure to sun. Um, but the, the smallest bees visit this one, and it has what I would uh, describe as an approach hercogamy, so kind of the, the shape um, of the anthers and the, the stigma have it so that as the bee lands on it, the first thing to touch is the belly, which is probably carrying pollen from the previous flower that was visited. Um, so 
Now we are going to finally leave the Bid Mountain Forest and then enter the Mossy Forest or the Cloud Forest. And this is where the Metanilla multiflora exists, which is the one that was all over the peak that kind of piqued my interest in it initially. And uh, this one has uh, yet another different uh, flower type, but it also has kind of that approach hercogamy. So a bee landing on it would first contact the stigma and then it would proceed to vibrate the, the anthers there. Whereas basically all the other ones we looked at, the, the stigma is below the anthers and would contact the, the backside of the bee, kind of in a region that is harder for it to access. But I spent a lot of time watching this one because it was uh, so easily accessible, at least if you're sitting on the peak, all sorts of things visited it. Um, many beetles were there munching on the anthers, getting their nutrients from that pollen. Um, but most of them, most of the flowers are probably okay. Like you can maybe see little, little specks of pollen here. So it's already been pollinated. It's probably um, going to turn into a fruit. And now the, the beetles are finishing off. Here's a nice little crab spider waiting for an insect to come by. Um, other beetles doing their thing. But uh, probably since I observed the, this one the longest, I was able to see the most number of bees on it. But basically buzzing bees of all different sizes I observed there from the very smallest all the way up to the very largest, um, including this one in the middle, which is a bumblebee, which is quite special in the Philippines. You really only find them in the, the higher mountains. Um, so buzzing bees are the pollinators and the very smallest ones, they spend several minutes per flower and uh, they're not necessarily touching the stigma, but maybe as they approach, they touch it. Um, whereas the very largest bees, they will just spend like a second on each flower, but they grab everything, they shake it all really violently and then they move on to the next one. So even though they are the least frequent ones, they're, they could still be the most important pollinators of this group, but it is kind of uh, generalist, obviously. Um, and here's just some, some close-ups of those, that smallest bee uh, manipulating some of these anthers here. It probably approached, probably contacted it, for, but most of the time it's not contacting it. Maybe it's doing a lot of pollen thieving. And uh, here's an action shot, it's buzzing, and then there's a little dusting of uh, pollen falling down there. Um, so basically kind of as a recap, I've introduced you to several different flower types. Um, a couple of them have been sort of the approach hercogamy, but one of them, the stigma was above the anthers. One of them, the anthers were around the stigma. And then basically all the others, the stigma was below that group of anthers. And that either contacts the back of the bee or this particular shot here, the bee is just kind of using it as a hook around its leg to steady itself. And then um, it's, it's vibrating the anthers right there. So um, lots of different ways for the flower to present to a, a whole host of different pollinators, um, all of from these same species that are kind of in the same habitat on this one little mountain, but they do kind of divide things up quite nicely. Um, I guess there's me in action <laughs> doing some observations, but I also did some uh, pollinator exclusion experiments to see what would happen if you, you didn't have any pollinators visiting it. And basically no fruit were produced, but if you can pollinate the thing, then it quite readily produces fruit. So it, it does need a pollinator, but it doesn't need to cross pollinate. And that was me using a tuning fork buzzing the anthers, and then there was a whole little spray of um, pollen shooting out right there. Um, so the dispersers on that one, Metanilla, back to Metanilla multiflora, are birds. They're generally small birds. The, the fruit change colors, and we have a bunch of different flower peckers here. They're not all from that same mountain. Um, and then here's a, a white eye as well. But terminal inflorescences, soft berries that are visually appealing, but not necessarily very tasty, seem to appeal to the birds. So basically that was um, one mountain in, in the Philippines and all the different species there, but I got to introduce you to a bunch of different groups and they quite nicely stratify themselves along different elevations. They have different growth habits. They have different flowers, flower types, pollinators, dispersers. They're kind of different in every way that you can imagine, which is kind of cool to see. 
Um, and they also represent quite nicely um, kind of the diversity that you can find in the Philippines and beyond. So now, uh, well, I guess a couple things that you don't find on Mount McKeeling that are just sort of interesting to look at. So this is also in the Philippines, don't know what to do with it, don't know what group it goes in, but it has this really interesting inflorescence where basically there's a modified stem here. And then I think basically a whole bunch of um, sessile, very clumped inflorescences that just kind of continuously grow on this fruiting stem and it gets longer and longer and longer. So this is a young one, it, it's kind of like a head, cephalophora, and then, um, as it gets older, it just extends kind of indeterminately and you have a bunch of bracts and fruits clumped at the end there. So interesting growth form there, kind of similarly interesting growth form, but the anthers are totally different in this one. So don't really know what to do with that one either, but it's, it's there, it's in the Philippines, it's interesting. <laughs> um, but enough uh, about the Philippines. So let's zoom all the way out to kind of the, the global distribution of metanilla. And basically what you can see here are estimated number of species in each region. So they're not all necessarily um, endemic to that area, but like if you were to go to Ghana, you would be able to find one species. Um, if you were to go to American Samoa, you would be able to find another species here. So it, it's pretty much, if it's wet and it's paleotropical, you can find metanilla there. And there might be about 400 species. So for some reason, it wasn't able to quite make it across the Atlantic to South America, and it wasn't quite able to make it across the Pacific to South America, um, but basically everywhere in between it is. And there's a few things I'd like to point out here. Obviously, Madagascar stands out as a center of diversity, especially in comparison to what is around it. So if you go to what's nearest by in mainland uh, continental Africa, and then you might find one species, whereas Africa has, I mean, Madagascar has about 70, or um, Borneo has 40 or so, but if you go to mainland South Asia and Southeast Asia, there's just a dozen or seven. If you go to the Philippines, there's maybe 90, um, minus, plus or minus. Um, if you go to New Guinea, this New Guinea has the least known about it, but there's a lot there. So maybe that's a reasonable number, but then Australia, of course, uh, hardly anything at all. So most of Australia is dry, not very wet paleotropical, but um, there are some tropical areas and there's at least one species, which actually is very similar to the, to that Metanilla radicans, which was the, the, the tall climber rooted in the ground on Mount McKeeling. Um, but yeah, so, there's the distribution overview. And now I'm going to just quick so show some pictures of, uh, I guess, examples of diversity from these partic particular locations. So if you went to Borneo, uh, these pictures are courtesy of Darren Pennies. You could find things like this, maybe in a Metanilla succulenta group and in a Metanilla crassifolia group, um, as well as many of the groups that I introduced you to from the Philippines. Um, you would also find, especially if you're looking in, in a herbaria that has unidentified metanilla in it, you might find something called plethiandra. That's because it has a plethora of anthers, like 30 or more sometimes. Um, but in other regards, it's very similar to metanilla, and it will be quite interesting to see where it actually shakes out in the tree. Um, or if you go to New Guinea, a whole host of other things. Again, there's some very similar ones to the Philippines like you already met, but then there's a bunch of other kind of different groups. So one of them in particular, this one right here in the top left corner um, has quite strange anthers as far as metanilla is concerned. And originally this was called Erpatina radicans. Now it's metanilla Erpatina. Um, but this one and this one right here, they kind of have that cone shaped flower type. Then there's a couple with kind of the bunched uh, flower types. There's some very coliflorous ones. And these all have very different anthers from what you would expect to find in the Philippines or elsewhere. Um, and then there's a, a very interesting group, the pseudostipular metanilla, it, which is kind of fun to point out because last uh, talk, Jeff Mancera pointed out that in Astronidium, 
there's a species that has these pseudo stipulars stipules at the base of the petal petiole. And then here, same family, but supposedly totally different group. Uh, we have the same exact adaptation in the same exact region of the world. So I don't know what it's for, but uh, for some reason it's, it's shown up at least twice, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, and then this one is just kind of an example of, I don't know what to do with it, but uh, Metanilla rubiginosa. To me, like those leaves especially don't look like a Metanilla at all, but it, it is in the paleotropics. It does have berries. Anthers aren't particularly interesting. So it, it probably is Metanilla, but, but who knows? Who knows where that will show up <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. So lots of things out there to, to still figure out. Um, now, finally, on to the last uh, center of diversity, and this really won't be my focus. So kind of that German contingent will hopefully be able to make a lot of sense of this. But I do want to point out um, kind of what I see are, are maybe four different groups. Like they haven't been tested. Um, no one else has ever used them. But at least I haven't been able to find anything that doesn't fit into one of these groups very well. So um, on the far right, we have maybe most of the species fit into this group and all the species in mainland Africa actually fit into this group, but we have the, the cone shape. Um, and then the anthers have very long ventral appendages. Um, then here we have this Metanilla sedifolia and it kind of has slightly dimorphic anthers and the anthers shapes themselves are very much like what you would expect to find in Asia. So it kind of has an Asian anther then here we have, it is like a Madagascan <laughs> anther, I guess. It's quite similar to the ones on the right, but they are all bunched together to one side of the, the stigma and the style. However, this configuration is completely the opposite of what you would find in Asia. Like the style would be bent the other way and the anthers would be facing the, a different direction. So they're kind of doing the same thing, but they've seemed to have uh, done it a completely opposite way. And then there's this group here, which I will um, have a special slide for. And this is what I call uh, pseudotubular flowers. So the two on the left are from Madagascar. And this is at anthesis. So they're, they're fully open. They're not gonna get any more open than this. The anthers surround the, the style there. And they're really not very ornamented. The, the appendages are basically lacking, but these are pretty large flowers. And the fact that some metanilla can produce nectar, um, and then you have this interesting shape here, really makes you wonder if there has been a transition in pollinator here. So maybe sunbird or something. But the real interesting thing is that you can go to India, which is this flower here, or you can go to Sri Lanka and you find exactly the same thing. So you have this really interesting morphology here that kind of links potentially at least, India and Madagascar. Um, one more really cool potential link between India and Madagascar is kind of uh, between this Metanilla sedifolia, which is kind of one of the only ones like it in, in Madagascar. But then you go to India and you have something that's almost exactly the same. So the flower is very similar. The anthers are very similar. They're slightly dimorphic. Um, the growth habit, the leaves, like basically everything. So another really interesting potential link between India and Madagascar. Maybe it was a stepping stone from Asia. Maybe they came back from Madagascar or something, but hopefully that can be tested at some point. Um, so now that was kind of a summary of the, the world distribution that we just focused in on uh, four of the main uh, centers of diversity. And now I just want to show, I guess, one more interesting kind of broad pattern that doesn't seem to be super linked. But um, there is a Metanilla ultramaficola, which we, we got to describe recently from Palawan. So back to the Philippines. And this one has uh, tuberous roots. Um, so this is the only, well, there's a couple in the Philippines that have tuberous roots. But also, if you go to Africa, Many of the species there have tuberous roots, totally different anthers. If you go to New Guinea, there's at least one species with tuberous roots. Again, totally different anthers. Um, 
or if you go, or here's a example of a tuberous root that's been cut in half, but this is actually from Pachycentria, which is uh, currently a separate genus, but I kind of have to include it because uh, perhaps one day it will be part of Metanella or will have to be part of Metanella, but it's a long time been recognized as separate because it has pretty distinct uh, features in the fruit that help separate it, help recognize it at least, and then the anthers are pretty different. So whereas most metanella have this dorsal spur, uh, this particular one, Pachycentria pulverulenta at least, has uh, a tuft instead of a spur. So these are very, very tiny flowers that have been magnified a lot. You can't see that very well with your naked eye, but it is a, a pretty interesting development there. Um, and with that, I, I kind of want to just leave you with um, a couple comments on uh, conservation. So here's another species that we got to help describe. This was the first one that I got to work on. And it's only known from two different locations in the Southern Philippines, fairly distant from each other, but they look very similar. One location has kind of pinker flowers, one kind of has redder flowers, but in other regards, it's it's basically the same, but it comes from a special type of soil like serpentine soil or ultramafic soil, which is very high in heavy metals. So in locations that have heavy metals, this is kind of what we want to do with them. We want to mine them and, and destroy everything. So um, heavy metal mining site going on in very close to and uh, surrounding the type locality of that species that was just described. So that's pretty unfortunate because this species depends on this type of soil and this is what we want to do to that type of soil. Um, however, the second location that this species grows is Mount Hamigitan. So it has the same type of soil, but largely because of, um, I like to think taxonomy, <laughs> because people have been able to catalog that this area has a lot of special things in it. Um, endemics or near endemics at least. So for example, our species here and this orchid species that has since been described. Um, this location in the not too recent past was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So um, I do like to think that kind of these inventories of species can make a difference. And then here is uh, Jeff Mancera, who you know from last week, and Darren Penny's uh, enjoying the bonsai forests on Mount Hamigitan in in 2019. Um, however, even if you have everything perfectly uh, protected, like, like on a Mount Makiling or in a, a Mount Hamigitan site, um, climate change could still really cause some, some uh, effects that we would uh, want to be aware of. So basically taking you back to Mount Makiling where, where this all started, if you remember, they're all nicely stratified, kind of in these mountain zones, the, the low mountain, the, the mid mountain, and then kind of the mossy forest type. If climate were to warm 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, um, the temperature at the very peak would be the same temperature as what has historically been at this, uh, sec this top line right here. So this is the, the line that kind of indicates the, the zone between the mossy forest and the mid-mountain forest. So if temperature raises two degrees, this line moves up to the peak and essentially the entire mossy forest gets booted off the top. And uh, species like Metanilla multiflora that are only found flowering in this zone also disappear with that. So it is just kind of one population, one mountain, but it, it is, a, I think, a pretty powerful example of what could happen with just a small amount of change that basically we're expecting to happen in the next 100 years or so. So it will be interesting to see, maybe in 40 or 50 years, if I can manage it, to go back and see how some of these things are doing. Um, however, I was able to return one time to this mountain after I had, had done kind of my initial research. So I started in... I was, I was there for a couple of years and I was able to identify the lowest occurring individuals of each species on, on, this, on this mountain. And like they were present before I came and they were present the whole time I was there. So about two years. And then I was gone for two years and I came back and then I wanted to find them again. So I kind of assumed that they should be there um, because 
they were obviously older than two years old and they were there the entire time I was there. So why wouldn't they be there two years later? Um, but one of the things I had noticed kind of at the end of my time here, there had been a particularly strong El Nino year. And especially the epiphytes in the mid mountain forest, like the, the lowest occurring Metanilla magnifica and such, they were visibly wilted. So these lowest occurring individuals really were living at kind of the, the lowest boundary of their tolerance level. And um, they were quite susceptible to changes in, in climate or, or weather at least. And so when I came back to my surprise, 50% of those lowest occurring individuals were dead and gone, which was very surprising to me because I obviously expected them to be there, but really it just kind of, obviously this is just anecdotal, but it kind of brought home uh, the, I don't know, really made real to me that like these things are very susceptible to slight changes. If you move something up just a little bit, then like that affects them and they, they may or may not be there the next time you're there. So on that, I guess, happy note, <laughs> I would uh, just like to make a few acknowledgements. Um, my current advisor, Dr. Barkman, my uh, advisor for my master's, Edwino Fernando, kind of a, a current advisor as well, Dr. Darren Pennies, and then various other funding sources and uh, locations that have been helpful to me in this, this process as I have explored this wonderful genus. So I am more than happy to take questions now, if anyone has any. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have raised my hands. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm so rude. Go ahead, guys, uh, uh, you know, I'm too rude. <laughs> Nico, you're first, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Well, sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's the Italian in me, so I always blame that. Mm -hmm. um, so Peter, thank you yeah. so much for a wonderful presentation. This, it was fantastic, really, so interesting. Um, it's actually fascinating to see that the bulk of the diversity of this group is actually sits on these large, mostly continental islands. So I was wondering if you have any plan in trying to figure out the processes that lead to this uh, diversity on this chunk of islands really is the Borneo and the Philippines and New Guinea. So interesting that, uh, of course, I've, you know, there are other species spread everywhere else and not so much on the continent. So it's, it is very, very curious, it, you know, distribution. Yeah. So, um... I suspect that things probably had their start in Borneo. And then um, the continental areas like mainland Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka and stuff that has very old forest on it, um, Africa as well. I feel like they were maybe just harder to invade than some of these other islands. So like New Guinea comparatively is very young and the Philippines, parts of it are old, parts of it are young, but a lot of it just kind of came out of the ocean and was there for things to colonize. And then um, not exactly sure why Madagascar has so many, but again, it is an island. So I sort of have a feeling that like these large islands, Metanilla was able to get to and then sort of radiate in, but it, and it was also able to get to the continents, but I don't think it was able to do nearly as well in those continents because maybe the niches were already kind of full, but yeah, just, just a hunch. <laughs> Okay, um, I also have a question. And first of all, sorry, Peter, for <laughs> being late. I had put down nine o'clock instead of eight o'clock. So I barely hopped out of bed and was like, Fuck! <laughs> okay, so that's my bad. I'm really sorry for um, not introducing you, but I'm sure Darren did a nice introduction. Um, thanks a lot for this amazing talk. It was so cool to learn more about Medinilla and see your um, altitudinal gradient. I think this was really nice setup, and I'm super impressed by all the natural history work you've been doing. This is great. I <laughs> can't wait for Manila part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as, as for, I, I have a couple of comments and questions. So first you ask whether anyone had seen similar ant behavior in other groups. I've seen this in Mekonia, at least 
on buds where a lot of ants will be sitting around and drinking something, actually some sort of nectar droplets forming okay. and then continuing to come to the flowers. But I've no idea whether this is, I've not, I've not studied any Medinilla flower in detail. So I've no idea whether these are similar secretory structures at the tip of petals or not. So no idea. Um, and then I, I wanted to know whether you've observed any interactions between the ants and the pollinators that come to the flowers, whether there's any sort of trade-offs associated with having the ants. And I don't know, do all medinellas have the ants visiting the flowers and sitting there? Yeah, definitely not all of the medinella produce the nectar and some of them I've rarely seen any ants on at all. Um, but they also tend to produce pearl bodies, which I didn't mention. So this just kind of makes it so that ants wants to hang around. So if you're growing these at home where they're not like um, accessible to ants and rain and stuff, like they kind of get all these little white spots on them. And some people are afraid that their plants have become diseased, but really it's a natural thing that I think ants clear off in the wild. So many of them do want to have ants on them, but for the most part, I, I never saw any ants interacting with the pollinators themselves. And oftentimes the species that do produce nectar when they're in the bud form don't produce nearly as much of it, if at all, when, it, when it's open. So they kind of oh, okay. give it over to the, the pollinator that is, is wanted at that point. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And for the, for the uh, companionate species, do you think um, the nectar they produce comes also from the petal tips or is it coming somewhere from the stamens? Assuming it is a reward for potential bird pollinators. Yeah, I mean, I think petal tip would be kind of a weird placement because you would you would want it to be kind yeah, of it will drop out probably. and they they drop down like this. So I really don't know if they produce nectar, and I don't know where they produce ne nectar. But I kind of hope that they do produce nectar somewhere. <laughs> I, I think I think so. I mean, since there are there are these observations from India that birds visit these flowers, it would make a lot yeah. of yeah. I mean, why yeah. would they visit flowers if there was no reward? Right. Yeah. And last, last thing that I'm done, um, I found it really interesting what you said about the trees dying when you came back. Um, and I saw something similar doing fieldwork in Ecuador 2012 and then coming back 2016. And I thought I could locate the same individual trees mm -hmm. and a lot of them were gone. Um, and I just wanted to know whether you noticed this really only at the lower um, range of the elevational distribution of each species or also higher? Yeah, I don't know how many of the higher up ones also died because I didn't know those quite as well. Like I identified the lowest one and those were the specific ones I could look for. And then the others mm -hmm. were just kind of, you know, a population. Um, I know that several groups that I had observed had been like washed away by landslides and such. So I know oh, yeah, that I <laughs> definitely many did disappear that I was expecting to see, but yeah, hard to say. Well, cool. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. It was really, really cool. That I, 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 Lou is uh, raising his hand, so go ahead. Okay, thank you, Fabian. Okay, um, Peter, great talk. I have a question regarding this uh, mountain, Makili, the diversity is really amazing there. So I, I've been wondering if you have morphologically found any um, hybridization there. I don't think I've had, found any hybridization there. There was one particular species on the backside of the mountain that I didn't introduce that I called Metanilla um, bonahensis. Um, but if I, I only found one clump of it. So it was quite rare, hadn't been collected from that mountain before. And it was kind of intermediate between the Metanilla magnifica and the Metanilla um, multiflora. So it was existing kind of at a lower elevation than both of them. So habitat wise, it seemed to be different. But if, if I had to choose a hybrid, that's the one I would have chosen to be a hybrid. But I have no evidence other than that. To, it doesn't seem to be very widespread. Thanks. Well, I, I will take my, my chance now. <laughs> um, first, I mean, amazing photos, amazing natural history. 
uh, it's really cool because that means that uh, you really are, are understanding the group. And I wish oh, oh, those observations on pollination and dispersal, you, you can publish it. We don't have enough of this um, na basic natural history information. And then somebody might go out and do it again. And you did it already. So um, I, I highly encourage you to get that out there. <laughs> um, so, but, but I have a... a well, sort of one observation that uh, amazed me is how how many different uh, both growth habits and leaf types and and flower types you have within one genus. It is it, it's, it's really, really impressive. And it'd be cool to, once you have a better phylogeny to look at how these things do like niche partition by types or if it's several evolutions of, of those flower types or is it one and radiation, I'm sure you are all you guys are all already looking into that. So my my, my more taxonomic question is um, the, the these segregates like Eteroblema and Plethiandra and and all those things. Do you have any sense? Are they really good groups? Uh, are they with are they good groups but embedded within a broader Medinilla? What what is your sense in whatever preliminary data you have or just morphology? Um, so the kind of the segregate genera, I, I don't have many samples of. The most I have are of Pachycentria, and that seems to be a really good group. So I would I would be surprised if that's probably not um, if that's mono, not monophyletic. Um, I would also assume that the Plethiandra is probably a pretty good group because that that feature of being basically restricted to Borneo, having these big thick leaves, and then having just tons of anthers that probably is a good character that they are one group. Um, the heteroblema catanthera distinction, not exactly sure how well that's going to play out. I mean, but they have like this unique wood morphology. Um, so that probably does link those two groups, but as, as far as those two genera, I don't know how close or, or distant they are. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we have, or people have been able to identify small groups and those are probably pretty good groups, but it's actually like putting them all together and, and figuring out if they all fit into this big giant metanilla group is kind of the hard thing. So I feel like maybe trust the small groups, but we're, we're trying to figure out what the, that big group is. Um, I think there was one more comment in in the chat by Julie um, about fruit potential fruit dispersers that you discussed, um, with the particularly with the cauliflower species, and she was wondering whether it could only be bats or maybe other animals as well that would I don't know like run up stems. Like you mostly suggested bats, I guess. Yeah. So for that particular one that I had observations for, with like the smell and everything. I mean, it makes a lot of sense for bats. I mean, I could, um, there could be various lizards and stuff that would be eating it too. Um, I don't know how well lizards smell and taste. I kind of feel like mammals taste a little bit better, but there, the Philippines is also very well known for its rodent diversity. Mm -hmm. um, rodents tend to be kind of more seed destroyers than dispersers, but these seeds are so small that it, I, I think it would be hard to destroy all the seeds. And most of the time, I think they would just get swallowed and passed out the end. So I don't, I don't see much issue with um, rodents being some sort of disperser as well. But yeah, it, it could be many different things. Well, having a bat as a disperser is probably bringing your seed further than having a rodent. Yeah, so. <laughs> it helps it show up on those islands better. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Um, I guess I have one question for the, the general public. Um, does anyone know how widespread like the tuberous roots are? So I, I know they exist in Sonorilla and things related to Metanilla and Metanilla, but I don't know how, if, if there are other places. So if, well, I, I know Monolina uh, okay. uh, has it and some other things uh, that 
you know, the, some in Bartolonia seem to to have uh, many things in uh, southeastern Brazil. Ketogastras have those like long tuberous roots. Uh, then Pleioquitan, which was part of what is now Myconia, they 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 are um, epiphytic a lot of them, and they have tuberous roots. But even the ones in that clay that are lianas, they they might have small tuberous roots. Uh, so and then and then Blakia uh, as well. Right. So there there is, and Lithobium Darren is just mentioning here on the chat. Lithobium, I forgot. Yeah, and uh, Octocaris, I think, also seems to have it, but th that's only known from two collections, and they are sort of iffy. So it is, it is out there, but it's not, it's not the most common thing. And then in Disokiti, uh, some of those uh, vines in the Disokiti. Uh, yeah, likewise in Sonorilla, there are several yeah. species with tuberous fruits, yeah. and so it's uh, again, it's not super common, but it's not rare because mm -hmm. you do find some of them. Cool. Do you think it has any? like biological, ecological function. I mean, they wouldn't need to store water or anything, right? It's like they well, usually grow in wet places. Many of them are epiphytes though. And if it dries okay, out for a day, then sense. it is beneficial to have a storage. Some of the collections say that it, it might be related to ants, um, like providing a place for ants to live, but that's just kind of always just been speculation and I haven't actually seen that. So I don't know if it actually does have to do with ants, like some of those actual ant plants where the ants hollow things out. Any, Any other more questions? <laughs> it's, it's also a money plant. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You, you need the Fiji. There is also in the Fi in Fiji. Uh, yeah, it's on, the the I don't know country flower of Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I think um, thank you, thank you so much, Peter. I, we look forward to number two um, next month. I believe is Anna Flavia who we're gonna have uh, talking about Microlesia, and uh, we'll be sending out the announcement soon and thank you thank you very much and uh wow that i this is awesome <laughs>